Okay, I want to thank everybody for joining us for today's presentation, Precision Medicine, Trends, Challenges, and Data Management Implications, presented by BioIT Solutions and Asterix Technology. Next slide, please. So before we get started, I uh, want to take a minute and tell you a little bit about who Asterix Technology is. Um, we are an informatics professional services and strategic outsource solutions company dedicated to serving the scientific community. Uh, Asterix was established in 1995 and is privately held. Uh, it originated as the IT division of a company called APBI Life Science. Uh, today we operate from seven offices uh, in the United States and beautiful Costa Rica. Our headquarters are in Red Bank, New Jersey, and we work with companies that are uh, Fortune 1000 Life Science Enterprises, chemical, CPG, government, and research institutions, places with large and fast-growing IT outsourcing compliance needs. The mission uh, for Asterix has and always will be to deliver scalable, sustainable solutions for the scientific community. You can go to the next slide, please. So real quick before we get into the presentation, um, as far as our services go, you know, what does that mean? It means that we work with companies to deliver end-to-end -end services that, that span the complete life cycle of scientific data systems. And when I say life cycle, what I mean is from <clears throat> the business analysis and enterprise architecture, this is where we're helping companies define exactly what type of solution they need and then how that solution is going to be architected to fit into their environment. Uh, and then we work with vendors, such as the one you're going to hear from shortly, on selection. You know, we go out and we find the right vendors. We try to match the right vendors with the right companies, depending on what we uncover in those business process analysis. Then we can do the development and the implementation. At the end, we can do the computer systems validation, and then we can provide a host of services after the fact. Everything from managing that application for you to providing uh, scientific and technical staffing services to staff the right people internally to help you manage that application and manage your lab. At the end of the day, we evaluate, implement, and manage systems to enhance the collection and processing of scientific data. So that's enough about Asterix. Let's go ahead and turn our attention to our uh, friends from BioIT Solutions. Today we have Michael Fannin and Bob Bellevue. Uh, Mike. Michael is the president and the founder, and Bob is the vice president. Uh, Michael brings 30 years experience in biotech applications. He's the former vice president and chief information officer of human genome sciences, and the principal architect of BioIT's one platform for software suite. And Bob, uh, again, brings 30 years as well in a variety of information technology positions. Uh, he works to design and build informatic solutions for manufacturing, analytical and process development. QC and clinical operations for a range of emerging life science companies. So gentlemen, with that, I'm going to go ahead and mute and I'm going to turn this over to you. Excellent. Excellent. This is Mike. Um, I'm really pleased that everyone can make it today and uh, good morning to you or good afternoon as, as appropriate, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, thank you, Kevin, for that uh, introduction and thanks to Asterix for hosting uh, these seminars. Um, we are going to talk today about precision medicine in general. Now, what I usually do at this part of the presentation when they're live is ask whether, uh, just to get a sense of the audience out there. So Kevin's going to send us a quick poll. I'm really asking a, a kind of a, a question that has only two answers. So do you come to this work mostly from the lab side as a technician or a lab manager? Or do you come to this informatics work mostly from the IT side of the world and software engineering? So I'd be kind of curious to see the composition of our audience. Um, we try to keep the presentation general and um, at a high enough level, but nonetheless, uh, we, we can certainly tune our comments to one audience or another if that's, if that's more appropriate. So Kevin, when you do get some responses, just go ahead and chime in and kind of let us know where, where, where that stands. I'm gonna push ahead here. Um, our talk today is really kind of going to be three parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about personal, really what we've been calling precision medicine in the industry. It's sort of been derived from sort of personalized or individualized medicine kinds of initiatives, but I really like the precision medicine term the best of the ones that are floating around out there. So once we have then uh, just a, a quick overview of the precision medicine, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob. So he's gonna talk about as someone who is responsible for building information management systems and architecting those, what are the key considerations that we really need to be, have our eyes on when we're dealing with the, the demands of precision medicine 
Um, and then I'm going to follow up with a case study talking about a, a, essentially a generalized case study that's based upon our experience with, uh, with one of our customers that's working in this area. So if we talk about precision medicine, if we look at the state of medicine that's current and what we have been seeing over the years, is that we typically see pharma companies coming out with a treatment that tries to treat a broad cross-section of the patient population. And what we see in practice is that there's a subset of people that do indeed benefit from the medication, another subset of people who may not respond, but they just don't, don't get any benefit from it. And another population, of course, can have adverse or toxic effects. So as medicine's evolving and our understanding of how medicines work evolves, we really are seeing the industry moving more towards this idea of stratifying those patient populations so that they get different treatments based upon their drug response. Are they good responders? Does, do, does their body just essentially ignore the drug or do they you know, have adverse effects, in which case we'd wanna take a, a, a different approach to treatment. So the introduction of some way to stratify those populations, this idea of a biomarker, some kind of measurement or some characteristic of those individuals that can help us pre-classify those so that we can match the treatments is really the promise of, of personalized medicine. And if we take the idea of precision medicine, it should reduce the amount of trial and error prescribing, right? We do some kind of deep measurement that's precise enough for us to essentially see differences among individuals. We would expect that then to, to help us reduce the number of adverse effects and of course the medical costs and, and whatnot of recovery and the, and the bad effects of of drug reactions that we don't anticipate. And we also see that these sort of treatments increase patient compliance because the patients are getting successful treatment and it really implements that feedback loop that you would want. There is a increased cost at part of this paradigm because we're introducing this idea of a step prior to prescribing of really screening somehow those patients so that we understand which population they're more likely, which drug is more well matched to that individual. However, even with those increased costs of the testing, um, we anticipate and we are starting to see in, in good cases here that we reduce the total cost of treatment as a result of increased clinical outcomes, better efficacy, fewer side effects. So this is really sort of the promise of precision medicine. I don't think there's anything here that we're saying that's, that's particularly unique. What we're seeing a lot of in oncology are these sort of tumor profiling methods where a biopsy of the tumor will be taken and will provide these molecular fingerprints. What genes are expressed, what mutations are in the sample, what are we seeing in those, in those cancer samples to help us actually tune the, tune the effect and one thing we're seeing now is that by doing this, instead of treating lung cancer different than liver cancer, than abdominal cancer, as we had in the past, we really are starting to see um, oncologists classifying cancers based upon these molecular fingerprints. What antigens, what cancer antigens are they showing? What, what's, what can we infer about the type of cancer and the cancer mechanism? from these deep assays that we can now perform and get very precise information from. So what this does then, and it facilitates this, this ability to um, get the correct drug to the patient, especially in these very difficult settings like in cancer, where different cancers don't all respond to the same treatments, they, they, and these, these stratified treatments can really help. One, particularly interesting case of this personalized precision medicine are situations where, like in the CAR-T therapies that we're seeing for uh, cancer therapies, is collecting the cells from the patient's blood itself, doing some kind of manipulation of those cells in order to essentially to supercharge 
your immune system, and then the drugs that res the actual cells that we grow up from that manipulation then becomes the drug itself. This is a really like poster child for precision medicine, where we've got a, essentially a lot size of one. We manufacture the drug with the starting material as the patient material, and we're starting to see these, these sorts of therapies take off. There's all kinds of variations of the technologies for how the T cells get man manipulated, but, but um, this whole cell therapy domain really shows an enormous amount of, of, of promise in the industry. So if we look at precision medicine and try to understand those of us that are working in the informatics kind of domain, what the implications are for us, well, certainly in the industry, we're seeing smaller groups of target patients, right? This is this in, impacts a number of different things. What's our lot size? How do we perform sufficient testing so that we can stratify the patient groups? We're also seeing, obviously, in this industry, a, a huge explosion of specialized skills, equipment, methods, and facilities. This is resulting in certain kinds of organizational responses that we're seeing in drug developers with uh, substantially more outsourced development and manufacturing kind of activities, very distributed work environments. Uh, we're seeing the emergence of these virtual companies where a lot of the work that's being done on behalf of the sponsor of the, of the drug is being done by partner companies in these, in these complex um, networks and so the managing the information in these kind of distributed sort of environments um, certainly has some some substantial implications for us one thing we're seeing is that information management during drug development is more critical than ever because the idea of a companion diagnostic or diagnostic that is tied to your treatment regimen is becoming more and more important and so rather than just prescribing based upon a physician ob observing the patient, we're looking at a situation where um, information is being used and collected. And, um, and as a drug developer, we're also developing the tools to do that. We're also seeing, obviously, an increase in the amount of data that we're dealing with and the speed at which it's being acquired and the different data types. And we also see that with this emergence of these networks of specialty labs and contract manufacturing organizations and whatnot, there really have not emerged an, a comprehensive set of data standards. So our ability to put all that stuff together and whatnot means we've got to understand um, what really links these data elements together and how, how they need to work together. So it does, it does really make for a lot of challenges for those of us who are involved in the data management aspects of, of um, supporting drug development. I did want to, before I turn it over to Bob, talk a little bit about big data. We hear about a lot about big data, oftentimes in, you know, with the Amazons of the world or the Walmarts or the, the in the retail setting kind of thing and what marketing data is being collected on us. And, you know, you've got the Twitters and the Facebooks, again, working with enormous quantities of data. But there are really four aspects of big data. One is the volume, right? Just how much is there? Certainly, we can accumulate a lot of data in biology, but it's not really the thing that differentiates biological results from some of these other applications of big data. What we see is an enormous amount of variety, right? If we're working in labs, we've got chromatograms, we've got imaging, we've got lots of these squishy kinds of data types along with more structured data types. Um, the speed of acquisition, of course, the velocity is certainly an issue. And what we call the veracity for the fourth V is really the confidence that we have in the data. What I have observed comparing what we do in biology with other industries, is that the variety and the veracity are really big issues in biology, right? How confident can we be in a measurement? What is the essentially the experimental error in the result? Um, and, you know, can I use different methods and achieve the same result uh, for a specific, uh, say, biomarker measurement or something? So the four V's are very appropriate for us to really understand in any solution that we put together, but I just wanted to emphasize our empirical observation that the variety and the veracity tend to be the bigger issues in in the biology that we deal with 
and not to the same degree um, the volume and the velocity, which has been the real big concern for a lot of folks who deal with, you know, what you historically hear as big data. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Bob, who's going to chat about the key characteristics for success of an information solution in this domain. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so now that we've discussed the trends and challenges, we'd like to describe the key attributes of a successful digitization project to support precision medicine. First and foremost is adaptability. At the outset of a project, you and your team has a general idea of what needs to be built, but the devil, as they say, is in the details. Once you get started, new requirements inevitably surface and your ability to adjust will be vital. And precision medicine companies are constantly evolving, so a solution that has the ability to adjust as needed is also important. Secondly, an interoperable solution is needed. Smaller market sizes are hastening the transition to distributed processes, so a solution that can be used across departments and even vendors is a must. Traceability is not only a regulatory requirement, but takes on even more significance in precision medicine due to the targeted nature of the therapies, often down to patient-specific drugs and drug interactions. Lastly, we suggest a tailored solution. Tailored is another way of saying user-friendly, but it also suggests a multifaceted system that provides role-appropriate views, enabling users from different functions to access information and features in an intuitive, uncluttered way. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, adaptability is the single most important characteristic. The software products or platforms you select for your digitization project will have a built-in set of features and functions, but inevitably you'll find limits to what those tools can do. When the need arises to expand their capabilities, you may need to fashion workarounds. So ask yourself some questions before settling on a product or suite of products. Can the product be expanded at all? Are you relying on the vendor? What about the vendor's development roadmap? Do they align with the needs of your organization? Certain classes of changes are really configuration changes. How easy is it to make those changes and who makes them? Is that something your people can do? Or do you need the professional services arm of the vendor? Also, what about change management? Are changes going to introduce regulatory risk? And if so, does the solution have the necessary controls to demonstrate fitness? At BioIT, solutions are one platform for software suite for adaptability. Scientists don't have time to wait for lengthy code release cycles. Changes need to be available in hours or sometimes minutes. It's not unusual for us to work with scientists and shout over the cubicle wall, hey, reload your browser so they can access a new or altered feature. Also, we own the roadmap because we developed the entire tech stack ourselves. So in those increasingly rare circumstances where one platform four doesn't have a needed feature, we can just add it. Next slide, please. Another aspect of adaptability is the data model or information architecture. Here too, there are considerations worth, worth asking. Does the product or platform's data model fit your needs as is? Are there ways to extend or expand the data model? And again, who makes these changes? At BioIT Solutions, we've constructed an information architecture that is broadly applicable to most life sciences companies, but it's proven highly effective for our precision medicine customers. You can think about our information architecture as a kind of blueprint it's a three-dimensional model that incorporates materials, inventory, and testing. Next slide, please. Of the three dimensions, we take a materials-first approach. Materials can be grouped into products or samples. When thinking about products, we define material recipes that include the bill of materials and sampling plans, just like you would if you were baking a cake. The bill of materials allows us to construct lot genealogy trees that can act as a scaffold for related information. Samples, on the other hand, are materials that get collected. Samples can be tested directly, 
but can also be prepared or processed into derived samples. For complex sample processes, we construct sample derivation maps that show sample genealogy and likewise can accumulate related information. It's certainly more work to construct a multi-dimensional model into which your information fits, but there are a number of advantages. First, there's this notion of completeness. By modeling the universe of expected samples and lots, you'll know when you have everything. And conversely, you'll know what you're missing. Also, by collecting information and immediately storing it in context, you can validate entries to improve data fidelity, and you can spot anomalous data sooner. Interestingly, precision medicine is blurring the traditional lines between products and samples, since a patient sample is first collected and then is transformed into the product itself. So a malleable information architecture is proving to be quite useful. Inventory is another important dimension to consider. We think of inventory as a way for material lots and samples to take physical form. A sample, as we discussed previously, is not actually a physical item. It's more like a description of a collection event. When the sample is collected, it becomes an inventory item. That inventory item can have an amount or volume, a location, and perhaps other attributes, such as a freeze thaw count, etc. And the history of the item's location and movements comprise its chain of custody. Separating the physical inventory from the work specifications provides another level of adaptability or flexibility in the data model. Defining the tests, results, and analytics is another common design time task. Tests are comprised of one or more measurements, which can have acceptance criteria. Testing and analytics is a big subject, so we only have time to scratch the surface here. But suffice it to say that an adaptable data model that can follow your product through its journey from development to clinical and ultimately commercial manufacturing as product knowledge increases has a lot of advantages. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The next characteristic would be interoperable. By interoperable, we mean that the successful solution should have the ability to serve multiple functions or even reach out to partner companies. It should have a robust security model that allows appropriate access to features and data, and also provide modern means to interchange data. Here we've listed common data interchange modes. It'd be great if all data was transmitted electronically, but sadly, that day is a long way off. Many CMOs are still using paper batch records, and the sponsor companies receive scanned PDFs where they have to pluck results and enter them by hand into Excel or another analysis tool. In this context, having a predefined data model to validate the hand-entered data against can result in higher data fidelity. For instance, a hand-entered lot number can be validated against a list of valid lots for that part, or SKU. For internal labs, instrument interfaces are a great way of interchanging data. These, however, tend to be very instrument vendor specific, and direct instrument interfacing with increasingly prevalent cloud-based LIM systems is presenting another hurdle. File-based interfaces continue to be our get out of jail card. Files can be uploaded and parsed, and again, validated against expected values. Modern file sharing services such as Box, OneDrive, Dropbox, and even FTP sites can be used to exchange data automatically. But now we're starting to see more application programming interfaces for very robust data interchange. Although these APIs are based on standards, they tend to have slight differences, and you'll need to have access to software developers to get them set up and functional. Next slide, please. Traceability requirements take on added significance in precision medicine due to smaller batch sizes and sometimes patient-specific material genealogy requirements. Our approach is to, de to develop structured and semi-structured workflows that take materials as inputs otherwise known as ingredients, 
and create transform materials as outputs. The outputs from one operation can become the input for the next, and so on. We stitch these materials together in parent-child networks that are akin to a family tree. In the case of a manufacturing workflow, the incoming ingredients can be specified as the bill of materials or the BOM. The BOM allows us to validate the ingredient lots against expected part numbers and expiry dates, etc. Sample derivation maps can likewise be constructed for complex sample processing operations that are typical in precision medicine. The diagram shows an autologous cell therapy flow where whole blood is processed and PBMCs are separated and further enriched, transformed, and amplified. In each of these operations, a host of analytical and process information is captured and cataloged. Next slide, please. Tailored is another factor for success. This factor is probably the hardest one for us to define. By tailored, we really mean two things. One, that it provides a personalized view of the data, and two, that it provides role-specific features. Additionally, we feel that a clean, intuitive interface is desirable. Many modern applications are so feature-rich that navigating their UI becomes a barrier to adoption. Next slide, please. At BioIT Solutions, our hope is to help each customer build an indispensable information asset. We have a saying that the more eyeballs we can get on the data, the better. Getting people from multiple functions and multiple perspectives results in higher fidelity and in turn, higher value data. The diagram shows a typical stakeholder map with folks from the lab, R&D, clinical, and even operations and business. Here again, building an information architecture that serves multiple organizations pays dividends. So before I hand it back to Mike for our case study, we can sum up the key characteristics for success in precision medicine. Next slide. You need to have an adaptable, interoperable, traceable, and tailored solution to keep up with the needs of today's precision medicine companies. All right. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate that overview. Um, the case study that we've chosen here is a company that's actually involved in autologous cell therapies. They're uh, currently engaged in a couple of phase one studies. Um, and the complexity of this process that they go through to tune their T cells in itself is quite complicated. But when you look at what's going on in the um, clinical world now that they're in clinical studies, it's really quite remarkable. So my Sponsor is a company that's located here in Maryland near us. Um, it was founded by people that we worked with in the past. And so I've, I've followed them very closely and they've been a customer of us. We started out with just a traditional limb system for in-house testing. Materials that they would get, they would try out different processes. It involves things with uh, nanoparticles and different kinds of complex assemblies and cocktails of antigens and, and really this sort of what we're seeing in modern biology, these kind of combinatorial, you know, change lots of little different things in the process as you go through and whittle, whittle down a particular therapeutic um, approach. So that was, you know, back in the old days would have been sort of it. This is the scope of the project. It's an in-house lab. We're doing some in-house testing and we're writing some software to facilitate that. Turns out that they are using a contract manufacturer located in California to do the, the drug manufacture for them. Now, again, since the drug is cells, we get the cells from the patients, right, at the various treatment centers and various locations throughout the US. And there's a material flow of the actual patient um, blood that goes to the manufacturer, right? And then eventually, once it's manufactured, then the drug goes back to the patient, right? So that's, uh, that's the first key material flow that we need to keep track of. And again, it's highly specialized and highly individualized in this precision medicine world. Now, as the manufacturer does the work, they're capturing data as well as some in-process and released product samples that are actually coming back to my sponsor. So we've got this 
this material flow as well. Of course, we've engaged, uh, the company has engaged a clinical research organization for management of clinical sites, uh, enrollment of patients and whatnot. There's also a biobanking lab involved, right? As the patients get treated and we monitor their progress, blood samples, perhaps bone marrow, perhaps other samples are gathered as part of the clinical protocol, nothing unusual about that. And those things have to go to a, uh, a biobank. So we have clinical samples as patients are coming back for their follow-up visits. Um, they go to this to this biobank. And this biobank is a CRO that also does some testing. So they will test for biomarker levels and they'll do some flow cytometry testing for cell populations as well as part of the clinical protocol. As it turns out, you know, that our company here is one of the recipients of some of these samples for additional in-house uh, testing that they perform, um, predominantly for translational medicine research. We also are seeing the emergence of these specialty labs. There's a sequencing and bioinformatics lab that does the sequencing of these variable T cell domains um, to identify what are the predominant clones that are involved in the reaction. Um, we also see biomarker labs. And again, these are located in different places even across the world. And it turns out, of course, that the samples that those are are dispatched from our biobank, right? Because they're they're actually performing these tests on clinical samples. So you're starting to see the emergence, as we talked about, of this this distributed and across organizational boundaries kind of domain that we're seeing, as well as the blurring between the patient samples that we're monitoring and the actual drug itself. It's, it's really fascinating, the emergence of this kind of thing that we've been seeing in recent years. And if we model the data flows that go with that, you can see from this animation that we've got kind of a hodgepodge of things. What the manufacturing contractor does is they prepare, as you see in traditional manufacturing, paper-based batch records and our team on site at our sponsor then takes those scanned PDFs and collects something on the order of 100 different data points per lot of material of really critical measurements that they want to keep track of, as well as just a few uh, things that allow them to identify and to tie that lot back to the patient and whatnot. For most of these other labs, we tend to have some kind of text file upload whereby they either somehow transmit us the file or we pick it up from a shared Dropbox like an FTP site or something like that. So each one of these different data types has a different file format. And again, many of you have probably struggled with this issue as well as that these, these, these different labs, based upon the type of analysis that they do, um, will indeed send data in somewhat different formats. And, and so we need to be fluid about how we perform the import and match those things up to the right patient to the right time point so that we can put those measurements in context. Um, so what does our user actually see at the end of the day once we've got this collection here? And we put together this little screencast to show one of the more popular visualization tools that um, our, our customers like to see where you can see that these are patients across time, pre-dose, of course, day zero is the day of infusion, the dosing, and we have uh, utilities for them to aggregate this data and present it in a, in, a, in a context relative to the study day calendar. And you can see through this uh, animation here that there are different ways to isolate different lines of interest, to hover over and get some information, there are options to click through to go to the underlying record, um, ability to change the subject, ability to change the test panel. Um, there are some other views that we'd like to do as well around um, uh, lot to lot variability, right? Within manufacturing is, is similar to this kind of view, as well as um, different processing steps in the manufacturing cycle. We use, use a graphic, uh, the same sort of graphic engine to, to provide a couple of the, these different key views. Again, the data is multidimensional. 
comes from many sources. And just to kind of wrap up, you can see the requirements in this case study for adaptability because we've got different labs that are coming along uh, online at different times. We've got new technologies that are being employed, uh, new test methods and analytical methods along the way. Interoperable is a very important characteristic as Bob noted, and you can see we have data sources that are no longer strictly from within the company, but through contract manufacturers and specialty research labs providing data to give to give us this view. Traceability is obviously very important to each one of these labs. When they deliver their measurements to us, we have to be able to trace them back to the patient, to the time point, to the custody of material um, that was taken at that point in time and have very, very precise records as you would expect. And tailored, we need some tools, as the one we've demonstrated here, for the correct audience to be able to see the data represented in a very logical, consistent, and visual way. So we're going to wrap it up here. Um, and uh, let me proceed to the next page here. Uh, Bob and I thank you for your attention and for hanging in there with us. Uh, we look forward to your questions. And uh, Kevin, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, thanks so much. Um, great presentation, guys. Really enjoyed it. Uh, let me go ahead and stop the recording.